that label of the outsider kind of became a badge of honor as I went on in life. And I figured out it's really cool to live on the outskirts of these these cultures and, you know, be able to take what I want, but then meld it into my own way and just like avert people's expectations. This is Sound and Vision on KEXP. I'm Emily Fox, and that's the West African-born, Australia-raised artist Genesis Owusu. He's out with his second album. It's called Struggler. Owusu describes himself as an outsider whose music takes twists and turns and genre spikes you wouldn't expect. The album weaves an industrial rock. Always thought I was living a lie. Rap. Make some noise for your mama's favorite agitator. I ain't saying none, unless I'm speaking for the paper. And funk. To a wusu sounding like Prince. To a sultry lounge singer. Struggler has a main character that is mentioned throughout the record, and that character is a cockroach. I caught up with the Wusu to explore more of this idea of him being an outsider, but I first asked what the roach symbolizes for him. The main character of the story, like you said, is a is a roach who is um, running and running and running, trying not to get stepped on by God. Both of these characters are, are metaphors. The roach, I feel, is a metaphor for us as humanity, especially living in these past few years that we've all experienced going through COVID here in Australia, going through these insane bushfires that we had, my house almost burnt down, crazy economic collapse in many, in many areas, wars that we can see on our phones. It's all felt quite chaotic and absurd and kind of dystopian in a sense. And the God character is, is a metaphor for those grand forces that I just said. I chose the metaphor of a roach for humanity just because I felt in the grand scheme of all of these things, it's easy to feel quite small and out of control and almost powerless. But I thought the roach was an interesting metaphor because, you know, the roach is just so hard to kill. It's this small thing, but it's like, you know, you think you've got it, you think you've stomped it and then you lift your foot and it's not there. Or like, you, it's the one thing that's supposed to survive a nuclear war, you know? So it's just this little thing that, you know, you think is is small and powerless, but it it always manages to get through to the next day, which I thought was was a nice metaphor for like the stubbornness of the human will to survive. I I was just talking about this with my partner because we have a a one-year-old and we just keep saying like, how as humanity, are we a species that has like survived for so long? Like this doesn't make any sense. Like, (laughs) for like, you know, like babies to be so helpless and yet we still survive or just like, how are humans still at the, you know, kind of top of the food chain when it takes us so long to develop and so many Mm -hmm. things can go wrong, you know, like thinking about like before like mass production of food and, you know, like, you know, medical resources, like how the heck did we survive as long as we have? It does not make any sense. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a marvel that I don't think we really give ourselves enough credit for, honestly. I think like from the dawn of time to to the absurdity of today, it's like, it's a wonder that we can get up and, and make it to the next day with all the craziness happening around us, all the nonsense and all the absurdity. So I think it, in a sense, this album has an underlying celebration of just like the, yeah, the, the human will to survive and persevere. 
Well, I was reading a little bit about your debut record compared to this one, and, and I understand your debut record also kind of had some characters, but they represented depression and racism, and that this record is more about how to get through those types of struggles. Can you talk a little bit more about the messages that you had on your debut record and, and how this one kind of looks at some of those issues with a different lens? Yeah. Um, so my debut record was called Smiling With No Teeth. It was an album where I had these characters known as the Black Dogs. One Black Dog represented racism and one Black Dog represented depression, which were two things that I was encountering a lot in my life up until that point um, and past that point. And I just thought those metaphors um, were, were just interesting ways to to capture those topics under one umbrella and, and, and make a, an interesting concept about them. This album, I guess in the same way you think of like an author writing several books. I think this album is is a different story, but I think, you know, when, when you have an author or you have a director and they have se several movies, you can see like a through line in their style of how they like to create or maybe what they like to talk about. So I think there's like a through line in that sense, but I definitely think um, I treated this like a like a separate movie or a separate book if I was, if I was a director or, or an author. I think it's interesting that you chose a black dog to represent both depression and racism because there's this thing called black dog syndrome that humane societies face where often humane societies observe that black dogs are passed over in favor of lighter dogs. Like black dogs will be in a humane society a lot longer than a blonde dog or just a lighter colored dog in general. And I learned about this from I think my mom, who owned a black lab, who was just like the best dog in the world. I don't know if it's if this is like comes from like a racist background or if people associate black dogs with darkness or sadness or whatever it may be. But I just think it's interesting that this concept of being passed over because the color of your fur is impacting <laughs> dogs. Mm. Well, the reason I chose black dogs specifically going into that album, I knew exactly what I wanted to talk about already before I started creating that album. I knew, you know, I used music as a tool for, for therapy, essentially. And the things that I wanted to get off my chest were the experiences that I had with dealing with racism and seeing racism around me, um, as well as my own, you know, dealings with my mental health and depression. And I, I'd heard you know, maybe going through high school, my principal was like a, a fan of like Winston Churchill speeches. And I think Winston Churchill used the euphemism of the black dog uh, as a metaphor for depression. So I already knew this going into it, but then trolling through my memory and, you know, rehashing my dealings with racism, I'd been called a black dog in my lifetime and, and seeing other black people and indigenous people in Australia being called black dogs as a, as a racial slur. So I thought it was interesting that I knew I wanted to talk about these two things, but then this term came up that kind of encapsulated both of the things that I wanted to talk about. So yeah, that's why I personally chose, chose that as a metaphor. about your background you know your, your family immigrating from Ghana to Australia and specifically a very small town in Australia and I think you had mentioned before like when you moved like you'd never seen a white person before and here you are like in this small town in Australia and I'm curious like how that upbringing informed your views on racism mm. 
Um, yeah, so I, I moved to from Ghana to a city called Canberra, which is actually the capital city, but no, no one really knows that. Um, it's very small. They call it the bush capital. I think it's got about 300,000 people now or 400,000. It's grown since I've been here, but when I got here when it was very small. Um, the community that I lived in, there were no other Black people. I don't think there were really anyone apart from white people. And, you know, being so young, I had never met white people. White people had never met bl- uh, a Black person before. So it was a very interesting, like, <laughs> exchange of culture and identity. It was essentially just, like, try- learning how to navigate life as, like, the outsider. Because, you know, I came with my family so they were all kind of going through it at the same time. So I didn't really have a necessarily like a role model who had been through it before near me to guide me through. So it was kind of just like a navigation of figuring out how to live as the outsider. And I think that really shaped how I live today and how I make music. That label of the outsider kind of became a badge of honor um, as I as I went on in life. And I figured out it's really cool to live on the outskirts of these these cultures and you know be able to take what I want but then meld it into my own way and just like avert people's expectations and when I started creating art then it became like I get to put all these little twists and turns and all these genre spikes in my music that no one would expect because I just learned how to navigate on on the outskirts of what people expected I suppose. Are you still living in Canberra? Um, Yeah on a technically I, I still like it's still on my like papers, <laughs> but I've been touring so much that like I'm barely I'm barely ever here. But I'm here right now. I'm I'm in Canberra right now talking to you. Because I mean, I, I just like see you know y- you not only you've won like all these awards in Australia and now you're making waves here in the states. You know, like you're you're making a name for yourself. And I I feel like when artists start to do that, they either immediately move to L.A. or if you're in Australia, I feel like you'd be like in Melbourne or Sydney or something like that. But mm. you are still in a smaller city. What about Canberra? has inspired you to still consider that home base? Um, I think I've really just grown to love it. Like I've grown to love its pace. I think I've got enough chaos in my life right now. <laughs> I think like my main, the main side of my job is to tour. So I I go to LA all the time. I go to, you know, Sydney, Melbourne all the time. I, I go everywhere. So it's really nice to just have a base where I can come back and not have to deal with all the the lights and sirens and and all of that stuff. I think it's also a place that's almost like a a blank canvas in a sense because it's so small. There aren't necessarily many like scenes or or movements to get caught up in artistically. Like I know when I started making music, there was like a wave in Melbourne. Like they were really into like jazz rap. So if you were rapping and you lived in Melbourne, you were going to do like jazz rap. And I guess it's, you know, before internet dominated everything, you know, New York had a sound and like the West Coast had a sound. But I feel like since Canberra was so small, it was a blank canvas and you can paint in any color you wanted. Like you weren't going to get swayed by what everyone else was doing because you know, not <laughs> everyone else wasn't really doing anything. And if they were, they were kind of just doing their own thing and it kind of, helped me to really reinforce like who I actually was and what sounds that I actually wanted to create outside of what was going on around me. Yeah, you had to create your own scene and sound. That's yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So there's a line in one of your songs that really stood out to me. It's in your song, What Comes Will Come. And the line is busy making new trauma. So I got something to rap about. Break down that line for me. Mm, okay, this is this might be a long a long line to break down, or it might not. I guess. Well, we'll it's, it it's there's a there's a um, lot in there. It's that's yeah. a heavy statement. <laughs> so, I guess, like I said, I started making music and I started taking music seriously as a form of of therapy. It was a form of figuring out how to take in and explain what was happening in my life externally, what was happening 
in my mind and body internally in regards to like depression and mental health. And, you know, so I'd put out these songs every once in a while and it was essentially just a, yeah, it was, it was essentially just the practice of therapy. And then I guess along the way, people started really liking the songs that I was putting out and, you know, fast forward to my first album and it got a lot of acclaim a lot of people really resonated with it, which, you know, I'm very glad and happy about. But I guess from there, it's like, this is a career now. And I can't really just like wait for, I don't know. It's like, it's like now, now that it's a career, I have to pump out this music with a, with a framework in my mind that this is more, this is a product as well. And I have to keep consistent. I have to keep getting people's attention and having my name out. And I suppose the purity of it kind of felt like it was under attack in a sense that that tool of therapy was like the main reason that I made music, but now I've got to make music as a product. I suppose I didn't really know how to do that is I think is the main problem. I think um, I didn't really know how to do that. I didn't really want to do that in a sense. So I guess when the when the prospect came to make the second album, it was like I'd made the first album. We'd done COVID. I toured a bit. And then it was time to make the, the second album. And I didn't really feel like I'd lived enough life yet. So it was kind of figuring out how to draw inspiration from a new well and 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 rejig my mind to to learn how to create music again but i guess before i actually successfully figured out how to do that it was like i use this as a tool for therapy so am i going to just have to keep like messing myself up to mm. to keep up with the demand of you know that this like industry is is, is putting on me you know so yeah i guess that's really the the breakdown of, of that lyric Trauma, so I got something to rap about Something flick the stabbing down Baby, what's that about? So, acting like I don't know And of course I blame my boots for the faults of my toe and that makes sense, especially since your first album was like about a heavy topic like racism and depression. But overall, you were able to find, you know, different muses. And here we go, a second album. And I also read that some of the inspiration for this latest album is you were reading um, Franz Kafka's a short story metamorphosis which was written like a hundred years ago and then also <laughs> samuel beckett's play waiting for godot um while writing this record and references to those stories come up a little bit on this album tell me the backstory behind metamorphosis and waiting for godot and what struck you the most about those stories when you were reading them well i think those stories really gave me a basis of like how i wanted to to approach my story and I think more so the inspiration or why I found them so inspiring was, was because they were written so long ago, but they still, I still felt like they were so hilariously on point with what we are all living through today. Like, for example, like the elevator pitch of, of metamorphosis is there's this guy who turns into a huge bug. <laughs> and in the, in the, like the first pas passages of the story, he wakes up and he turn, he's turned into this huge, they just call him a pest or a vermin. So he's essentially this huge bug. And his first thought isn't like, what is going on? Things that you essentially think would be your first thought when you turn into a huge bug. His first thoughts are, oh, damn, how am I going to get to work today? What's oh. my boss think? You yeah. know, like, and I thought that was just like so hilariously on point with how we were living as a society, you know, like we were going through these things where, you know, if you put them in a list on paper, it would sound so crazy that we're able to survive in a world like this, but we do. And every day, every morning, we we do the same thing. Essentially, we wake up, we put on our suit and tie or whatever, and we keep it pushing because these bills got to get paid. But I, yeah, I thought that was so hilariously on point that Franz Kafka was able to, to capture that a hundred years ago, um, but also through the framework of turning this guy into a into a huge bug. Waiting for Godot is is almost um, inspired me in a similar light because it took, I guess, what we are going through today, but but really just turned it into took it through this absurdist lens, which is 
I guess what I wanted to do when I made this album, I think the, that philosophy of, of absurdism was a, a, was a real foundation for, for me and, and how I created this story. There's a very explicit waiting for Godot reference where it's like, I can wait here for Godot or pick my legs up and move. And that's because in waiting for Godot, it's like a two, three hour play or something like that, maybe two, two hours. And the whole play, they're just, um, it's two characters and they're literally just standing in the same place, <laughs> waiting for this person named Godot that neither of them have met. And yeah, that is the whole play. They're literally just standing there talking to each other. Some people walk past them every once in a while. But yeah, I guess it's just a, a metaphor for, I guess, waiting for life to happen or waiting for the answers to come and essentially, I guess, squandering your time instead of actually living and finding life for yourself. So yeah, in Tied Up, it's essentially about recognizing the, the chaos and the absurdity around us, but like putting our, our hearts and minds into, into gear and, and pushing through and persevering despite all that. Pump that thing right back, cause then what else can I do? I can wait here for guitar or pick my legs up and move. They only let me whimper when I'm crying to a groove. It's a wild west, baby, life's a saloon. Overall, what would you say were the biggest inspirations for this record? Like, as you move away from this idea of music solely as therapy and starting to, you know, want to want to create a, a discography for yourself, what were some of the things that you really turned to for inspiration on this record? Yeah, I mean, those were the biggest two things. Franz Kafka, Metamorphosis, uh, Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett and uh, Berserk, which is a manga by Kentaro Mura. Those three things were the biggest inspirations for the album. And I thought it was interesting because generally you get inspired to make music from other music. But, you know, when I was a kid, my first ever form of expression was through short stories. And then that transitioned into poetry and then that transitioned into music. So this kind of felt like a, a return to center. And I think I realized through this that I've always just been a storyteller. And I think that's what I really want to do. And the medium for which I've told stories has just changed throughout the years. Um, I think my first album was a story. And I think this is very much even more a story. And I think that's how I managed to to rejig my my mind and, and inspiration and that realization through reading and watching these stories that this whole time you know whether it's through making music whether through live performance I've always just wanted to tell stories and that's always what I've done and I guess that's what I'll continue to do Amazing. Well, congratulations on the record. It is called Struggler, and I've been speaking with Genesis Owusu about his latest record. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I'm a roach, I'm a freak boy. I saw the world burn, but I smile. This is freak joy. I know you wanna, I know you wanna, I know you wanna, I know you wanna. It feels scary, but you gotta get your head out the sand. I know you freaky, but you gotta keep your shit in your pants. Unless you wanna, unless you wanna, unless you wanna, unless you wanna. Don't wanna turn out just like you. Hating everything that you do. I hope I figure out a thing or two. That was Sound and Vision. Please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast, and consider giving a one-time $20 donation to help support this show at kexp.org slash sound. Thanks for listening.